you think designing a custom guitar is easy, think again. Hey guys, it's Chris with Highline Guitars. Welcome to my Highline Guitars YouTube guitar building channel. Today's episode is going to be part four of my four string precision bass inspired guitar project. In part three, I had described all the different parts and components that I plan to install on the guitar. However, there was one very important part that had not yet arrived. It's a part that I need in order to finalize the design of the guitar before I start to carve, route, and uh, create the body, the neck, and the fretboard. And the part that I'm talking about are the bobbins for the pickup. As you know, or if, you, if you've been following my channel, uh, you're probably aware that when I build a guitar, I make my own pickups. And that means I have to order all the components for the pickups. And typically what I like to do, what, what makes it simple, is I like to purchase a kit that contains all the components. And you can get these kits from a wide variety of different uh, retailers out there. Uh, the retailer that I use for the, in, in this situation is CE Distribution, and I'll put a link in the description down below. They have a variety of different pickup kits, so you can make single coils, uh, you know, like for a Stratocaster or a Telecaster, uh, P90s, uh, uh, bass pickups, you know, for uh, precision bass type pickups, as well as jazz bass type pickups, as well as humbuckers. And the kits are nice because they contain everything that you need except for the coil wire. That you have to supply yourself. But when I went to order from CE Distribution the, the, the kit for a precision bass pickup, they were out of stock. So I tried to do some searching online, and as it turns out, it seems like all the suppliers out there who sell these parts were out of stock. So I decided I would just stick with CE Distribution and put it in an order and hope that it would get here in a timely fashion. And as luck would have it, uh, the, the kit arrived last Friday. So it was too late to include into part three, but I can include it into part four, which is a good thing because what I'm going to explain in this, this episode is why I needed to have these bobbins before I could proceed with actually constructing this guitar. Okay, so what you see here on my computer screen is a full-size, full-scale, top-view drawing of this uh, bass guitar project and at first blush it looks like a typical precision bass however if you followed along in in episode one you'll know that I tweaked the design a little bit to suit some of my own personal uh, tastes and philosophies about what makes a great guitar now the reason why I needed to have the pickup bobbins in my hand before I could proceed with the build is so that I could figure out exactly where to place them. Now, typically, if, if I was building an exact copy of a precision base, I would be using Fender uh, components, a Fender bridge and Fender tuners, and everything would be dimensioned the way the Fender uh, precision base is, is set up. And so I could just probably place the pickups in the same location and it would be fine. However, since I'm using an aftermarket bridge, it's a, a hip shot kick ass and hip shot tuners, as well as a neck that I have slightly uh, altered in terms of its width dimension, I'm going to have to figure out exactly where to place these pickups because placing them in the same spot where Fender places them probably isn't going to work. So what I had to do was take a look at what my string spread was going to be at the base or at the bridge and how that tapers as it uh, approaches the nut. And then that way I could kind of get an idea of where to place the pickups. What I have here is a representation of the string spread for this particular bridge. And you'll see I've got a red line at the top and a red line at the bottom. That represents the maximum string spread that is possible with this bridge. The blue lines indicate the minimum string spread for this particular bridge. Because remember that the hip shot kick-ass bridge, the saddles can be adjusted 
for lateral position so you can adjust the string spread and the spacing between each string. So the red and blue string at the top represents the E string and the blue and the red lines at the bottom represent the G string. So by indicating the minimum and maximum string spread here, I can visually place my pickup bobbins so that I can have, I can easily adjust the saddles to place the, the center of the string right where they need to be between the corresponding pole pieces of the bobbin that they pass over. So with the E string, I want to make sure that I can adjust the saddle so that the center of the string is going to be between the top two pole pieces on the forward bobbin. And then on the G string at the bottom, I want to make sure that I can adjust the string, the saddle position, so that the string is right over the very center between the bottom two pole pieces of the aft bobbin. And then, of course, the pickups themselves are placed halfway between the front of the bridge saddles and the end of my fretboard, so roughly in the center here. And then, of course, I can also adjust the A and the D string saddles to place those strings where they need to be over the pole pieces on the, the corresponding bobbins. So that's the reason why I need to have the bobbins in hand so that I can correctly and precisely position the pickups for not only maximum tonal performance, but also so that I can adjust my string spread and um, be assured that I'm not going to have any issues with how the strings line up with the poles. So once I did that, what I was able to do was to create a, a more accurate representation of what those strings are going to look like once the saddles have been adjusted correctly. And as you can see here, the the strings are also drawn to show their, their dimension, their gauge, their diameter. The top string, the E string, is a 0.105 inch diameter string. The A string is a 0.085 inch in diameter string. And then the D string is a 0.077, I think, 0.07 inch diameter string. And then the uh, G string at the bottom is a 0.05. So I have adjusted the bridge in order to, you know, virtually on my computer, I adjusted the bridge so that I can make sure that the strings are going to fall right between the pole pieces where they need to, to pass over the pickups. And... A couple of other things to note. This also allowed me to check the position of my tuners to make sure that I was maintaining a straight string pull from the nut. Now the other thing I wanted to mention, because I know some of you are going to ask this question, is how I determine the placement of the bridge. What I did was I took the actual kick-ass bridge from Hitshot that they had sent me and I adjusted the G saddle all the way forward as far as it could go uh, to the point where it couldn't be moved any further forward. Then I backed it off. I moved it back about a sixteenth of an inch. What I did then is I placed the bridge on the body so that the face of the G saddle where the string will come off the bridge is exactly 34 inches from the face of the nut. And by doing that, I have the bridge in the best possible position. That way, you know, I can still move the saddle about a, you know, a sixteenth of an inch forward, which is highly unlikely. In almost all cases, when I intonate this G string, the scale length is going to increase slightly from that 34 inches. What's important, however, is the lateral or not the lateral, the uh, fore and aft adjustability of the other saddles, especially the E string. I need to make sure that I have enough fore and aft adjustability to intonate that string. And in, in most cases, even though you know exactly what your scale length is going to be, in this case it's 34 inches, when you intonate the strings, the scale length is going to increase slightly. And the thicker the string, 
the more that scale length is going to increase. So right here I have the uh, G string right at 34 inches in length. And like I said, I have a little bit of forward adjustability, but I have plenty of aft adjustability. With the other strings, uh, the scale length will increase incrementally with each one based on its thickness. So the E string, which is the thickest string, is going to have the longest scale length. It could be upwards of 34 and a half inches uh, for the scale length once that string has been intonated. So I need to make sure that I can move that uh, G, uh, E string saddle back um, by roughly a half an inch. I think in this case with the hip shot bridge, it's it's like 0.44 inches that I can move it back, which should which should be plenty because that that E string uh, when intonated, I would expect it the scale length to be somewhere between 34 and a quarter and 34 and three eighths. So I, I that shouldn't be an issue there. But a lot of folks will run into a problem where they they place the bridge. Uh, where they can't get enough aft adjustment to intonate their thickest strings. So uh, I do so by moving my G, uh, G saddle all the way forward and then back a 16th and then placing the face of that right at the 34 inches. So that, that gives me the correct bridge position. With my plan finalized, I was able to sort of tweak some of the files that I had already created and get it all ready and set up for cutting on my CNC machine. And that's what you see here. This is Easel Pro, and I have all my files, all my cutting operations organized at the bottom of the page. You can see all these different pages here. Each one represents a different carving operation from start to finish. And it will begin with the fretboard. And what you see here is the marker dots and the slot for the nut. And once that's done, I will then cut the slots for the frets themselves. Then I will proceed with carving. This is the G code for the radius of the fretboard. Then I will do a perimeter cut. And once that's done, the fretboard itself is essentially finished. I can take the blank off my CNC machine, cut the tabs, and liberate the fretboard from the blank. Then what I'll do is I will clamp my neck blank to the wasteboard and begin the carving operations uh, just for the neck. And what you see here is the first operation and that is to cut the truss rod slot. And as I mentioned in the last video, I'm going to be using a 24 inch long two-way uh, truss rod that is going to be adjustable at the heel. Once the slot has been cut, the next operation on this side of the blank is to cut the face of my headstock. And this is a two-pass carving operation. The first pass is going to be the rough carve, which will hog out most of the wood, and then is followed by a finishing pass, which will smooth out the surface. When that's finished, all the operations for the top side of the blank are done. So what I can do is unclamp the blank, flip it over, clamp it back down, and start carving the other side. And that will begin by drilling four holes which are the mounting holes for the neck. And that's going to be done with an eighth inch diameter drill bit. So once that's done, I will then swap out the bit for a quarter inch diameter end mill, and I will begin cutting the basically the back of the headstock, the, the contour, as well as the heel for the neck. And I'll start with a rough uh, carving pass, which hogs out most of the wood, and I'll follow that up with a finishing pass, which cleans up the surface. Then I will finish by doing a perimeter cut, and that smooths out the vertical edges for the uh, headstock, the neck, the heel, as well as the tuner holes. Once that's done, the neck is finished. I can remove the blank, cut the tabs, and liberate the neck. And what I would do next is I would install the truss rod and glue on the fretboard. And while I'm clamping down that fretboard to let it dry, what I can do is then proceed with the body carving operations. And that will start out by clamping my blank to the wasteboard. And I'm going to carve the back side first. So what I'll do is I will drill the four holes for mounting the neck, as well as the recess for the uh, neck bolt ferrules. 
Once that's done, I will then proceed with cutting. This is going to be the belly relief contour in the back of the body. And it starts out with a rough pass to hog out the wood. And then I'll follow that up with a finishing pass, which will smooth out that surface. Once that's done, the back of the blank is uh, the body blank is complete. So I can unclamp it, flip it over, clamp it back down, and proceed with all the carving operations on the front of the body. And that's going to start out by drilling all these little holes. And these holes are uh, obviously to mount the pick guard. So I'll drill those first. I'm using a 16th inch diameter end mill to do that. Once that's done, I'll switch out to a quarter inch diameter. Uh, down cut bit, and I will begin cutting the pockets for the pickups, the control cavity, as well as the neck. And I use a, a down cut bit to start the carving operation because it gives me a nice, smooth, clean surface with no fuzzies and no tear out. So once that uh, shallow pass has been completed, I'll switch out to a quarter inch diameter up cut bit, and I will finish carving out those pockets, as you see here. Then what I'll do is I will do the rough carving operation to cut the perimeter shape of the body as well as a forearm contour. And then once that's complete, I will then do a finishing pass just to smooth out the surface of that forearm carve. And then I'll finish this, uh, the front of the body by doing a perimeter cut to smooth out the vertical sides of the body. And then once that's done, the body's complete. And by then, the glue uh, where I glued on the fretboard to the neck should be set up enough to where I can remove the clamps. And if I wanted to, I could bolt the neck into the body. However, I still need to do a little bit of finish sanding. I'll probably sand the body and the neck with uh, 220, probably upwards to 400 grit to get the surface really smooth in preparation for the finish. However, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I still have one more operation to complete, and that is the pick guard. And this first operation uh, will involve using an eighth inch bit to cut out the perimeter shape, the pockets, and drill all the holes for mounting uh, the pick guard as well as the holes for the controls. And then I will use a 90 degree V bit to cut the 45 degree beveled edge around the entire perimeter of the pick guard as well as to bevel the uh, mounting holes so that the screws when they're when the pick guard is installed the screws will sit flat or flush uh, with the surface. All right, well, I am finally ready to start cutting on this guitar. <laughs> it took four episodes to get to this point. You probably thought it was never going to happen, but it's like I teased at the beginning of this video. If you think that designing a guitar is easy, you got another thing coming. And I hope that this episode and the past three episodes in this series will kind of help explain this whole process and why it's so important, especially when you're designing a custom guitar that you're going to build from scratch. If you try to skip any of the steps or jump too far forward or jump too far forward too fast, there's a good chance that what you're going to build is going to end up nothing more than wall art or firewood. So you really got to pay close attention to all the different components, their dimensions, and how they relate to one another in order to achieve a design that's going to actually work and produce a satisfying experience when it comes to building a guitar. That's why I think so many folks like to build uh, kit guitars, because that whole thought process has been done for them. At any rate, I hope you found this episode to be useful. As always, you know, click like, uh, click subscribe if you don't already subscribe to my channel and like watching videos on building guitars. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, post them down below and I'll try to answer them or somebody in the community will try to answer them. And if you'd like to show my channel some support, head over to eGuitarPlans.com and purchase a plan either for a guitar where all that uh, decision making has been made for you. Uh, or you can buy a plan for one of the different kinds of tools that I use to build guitars. And 
Even if you don't build the plan, just know that your purchase is helping to support this channel and to keep me going. If you want to help support this channel but don't want a plan, you can always purchase a Highline Guitars t-shirt. Uh, you can see those in the merch shelf down below. And if you can't see that merch shelf, there is a link to my t-shirt store in the description below. So, as always, take care, stay safe, and I will see you in the next episode.